Welcome to Wall Street, the epicenter of financial power in America, perhaps the money capital of the world. The globally oriented financial firms based here in the New York Stock Exchange that operates here have extraordinary influence on the politics and policies of this country. No one has elected them, and in fact, these financial firms are trying to undo the regulations and new laws governing them imposed by the Congress. The people on Wall Street are just one of a number of unelected and very powerful forces that operate in the shadows, behind the scenes. They're the media uh, forces. Uh, they're, they're the military and industrial forces. They're the corporate forces. And they're the forces that we'll be investigating in this television series which asks a question that most of our media does not. Who rules America? Every four years, Americans go to the polls to elect a president. It's a ritual that goes back to the founding of the nation in 1776. Our economy seemingly on the brink of collapse. High unemployment. Every four years, politics and politicians dominate our television screens, dominate our news, and dominate our national discourse. I'm Ron Paul, and I approve this message. When independent watchdogs called this president. President Barack Obama is running for re-election. Mitt Romney stood with Big Oil for their tax breaks, attacking higher mileage standards in renewables. So when he you is see attacking and being attacked by Republicans. He, he said he would turn this economy around in three years, or he'd be looking at a one-term proposition. We're here to collect, all right? The two parties may be fighting a political war, but pundits label it a horse race, fueled literally by billions of dollars in campaign contributions used for pervasive Welcome advertising. To where one president's failed policies really hit home. Welcome to Obamaville. The focus is on political personalities, not the forces they represent. A large industry of commentators and pollsters are paid to tell us who's ahead and who's behind. The focus invariably is on the candidates, not the issues. But everyone knows the campaigns are run behind the scenes by professional strategists, media experts, and political advisors. Then there's going to be a one-term proposition. The political ads are cynical and slick. Almost every word is scripted. Symbols trump substance. Slogans are market-tested, aimed at promoting perception and reinforcing prejudices. That a world nation Marketing is the mission, selling, not telling. On one level, this whole spectacle is presented as a triumph of democracy, as if the candidate who wins will run the country. But being in office doesn't necessarily mean being in power. Americans believe they are determining their future. Are they? Do most know, or are they ever told, who rules America? I just think that these people, uh, you can't really see them. <laughs> yeah? That's what I think. The, the people who rule America? People are behind the screen. They are behind the screen. Invisible? To the general public. And do you think people really know what's going on? To some extent, yes, and to some extent, no. To what extent, yes. To what extent, no. About 50-50. Who rules America? There's no one right answer. Pulitzer Prize-winning American historian Eric Foner says it's a question that raises many more questions about power that works from the shadows. Who rules America? Uh, you know, there's no one single easily defined group who rules America, but I think you know, not just now, but I think for a couple of generations, we have had a, a, what, what the sociologist C. Wright Mills called in the 1950s a power elite, an interlocking set of connections of people in business, in politics, in the military, <clears throat> who pretty much determine the parameters of possible change. It's not that they rule America in a conspiratorial way 
And of course, there are elected officials, but the leeway of those officials is constrained by what you might call the permanent government. Presidents come and go, but there's a kind of permanent establishment, what you know, President Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex, but now it's more a military-financial complex um, that really, you know, determ as I say, determines the limits. We're at the Left Forum, a gathering of progressive intellectuals and scholars and students held every year here in New York City. There are 1,400 speakers this year. They don't agree on everything, but they do agree that America is not the democracy it claims to be. They all want to know who rules America. Professor Stanley Aronowitz writes about the research of this man, C. Wright Mills, who a half century ago wrote about the existence of a power elite that activists today refer to as the 1%, the people who run things. His contribution to understanding the nature of power in America is in the first place to identify three institutional orders that really together form the power elite, an elite that is generally speaking unresponsive to the people, unresponsive to democratic liberties and democratic procedures. And he said the three groups were the corporate capitalist uh, institutions, the military, and the third one was the top layer of the political uh, directorate, he called them, and they, were, they are the national uh, leaders like the executive branch of government, not even Congress. He said Congress was in the middle levels of power. It doesn't really share the decision to make war, the major economic policies and so on. It participates at some level, but basically it's out of power. And he said that really has undercut the whole pretense of progressive and of representative government. This may be why in recent surveys, only 7 to 9 percent of the American people in both parties believe that the Congress, the so-called People's House of Government, is representative and capable of solving the country's problems. If politicians are trapped in a polarized and highly partisan stalemate, who does exercise the power to decide what the country's priorities and policies should be? We asked J.K. Fowler, an editor of The Mantle, a political magazine. I think it's extremely complicated. I think there's not one particular answer for it. Uh, I think that a lot of the stuff going on in America right now is being led by money, and moneyed interest in Washington in particular. But I think there's a bubbling movement from the ground up as well that's happening. Is there a ruling class in America, or is that a, an outdated concept? No, oh, I'm a strong believer that there's yeah. a there's a class in particular in particular in New York City where but I don't think it's they're not hidden away in some room with nefarious deeds in mind. It's it's more it's more structural. There's certain clubs they go to, there's certain streets they live on. They're interacting with one another more. We put that question to Erin Crowell, a 30-year-old working-class mother from a small town in Wisconsin who is working two jobs while pursuing her education. If I was to ask you, like, who runs America, who rules America, what, what is your, you know, what, what, what is your perception of that? People that have the money to do so, you know, um, you know, people that, that, that have the money and the, the resources to send a lobbyist to Washington, you know. Like nobody from my town could afford to send a lobbyist, you know, and say, hey, Harley Davidson is, you know, threatening to, to move their plants to China unless, you know, everybody takes pay cuts, you know, and could literally shut our town down, you know. We can't afford to defend ourselves. Do you feel as an American citizen that you have power in our, in our country? Do you feel as if you have the ability to get your dream achieved? I feel like it's slipping away. Um, I don't think I do, you know, because it feels like the closer and closer I would get to that, you know, like just a dream for me is to finish college, you know, and take care of myself and take care of my son, you know, but even that now, you know, and, and, and I understand like 
most, a lot of people in my position aren't even able to get that far now. So if the citizens who are supposed to be in charge don't feel they are, who does? What we found is that by and large, it's the wealthiest Americans who call the shots through unelected institutions that drive agendas in their own interests. There may be a cabal running things, but in the end, the state and the system merges, argues Canadian political analyst Leo Panitch. I don't think there's an external force controlling the American state. The American state is capitalist to its core in the very way it's organized. It doesn't do it because there's too much influence from Wall Street. It does it because it is structurally embedded with Wall Street. It doesn't do it because there's too much influence from a military-industrial complex. It does it because the military-industrial complex is inside the state, is funded by the state, is part of the state. Sure, there are people who conspire and there's people who act in secret, but capitalism is not a conspiracy. The people who have the wealth, they're not a conspiracy. We know who they are. Uh, we know how they collect this money, they take it out of our pocket, they put it in theirs, and it's not a big mystery. There seems to be corporate forces, in addition to Wall Street, that essentially help guide our political and economic direction. Leading are America's top corporations. Political analyst Michael Clare has studied the political economy of oil for 20 years and says a lack of media coverage keeps the public in the dark. Does the media cover it? The media doesn't cover this for the most part. In fact, the media is largely in league because of the advertising dollars that the oil and gas lobby provides. They're very heavily dependent on advertising revenue, so they're very careful in what they say. Who are they accountable to? Are there laws really controlling and regulating what they do? There are laws, but they have been written largely by their lobbyists to favor them. So, in fact, uh, the, the laws, for the most part, are, are in their favor, not in the favor of most Americans. Is there an issue where we've seen this very clearly, where the interests of the oil industry or the, or the energy industry is in conflict with the interests of Americans? Well, I would give an example that uh, the oil industry has been pushing for drilling in the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico and off the coast of Alaska, for example, and they get all kinds of tax benefits for that kind of deep water drilling, and they were able to do so during the Bush period with absolutely no oversight whatsoever, hence the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Most Americans experience the oil industry in two places, at the gas pump where prices often rise because of speculation, not just supply and demand, and also through TV advertising that paints this very profitable business in the most positive of terms. I'm still here and so is BP. We're committed to the Gulf for everyone who loves it and everyone who calls it home. That's good for our country's energy security and our economy. Which brings us to another set of corporations, the media companies. Jeff Cohn has been in the media and written books about its impact in shaping how Americans think about their country and its system of power. He says media companies push propaganda for war. It's the same exact media qu quoting the same exact experts that pushed our country and the world into a war with Iraq. And we were told by these media, oh, we're so sorry, we didn't know, you know, we made a mistake, next time we'll be more vigilant. But here we are next time, 10 years later, and the same media are blowing smoke about a weapons program in Iran that doesn't exist. There was no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq either. And so we're hearing, uh, it's, it's like, uh, you know, when the war drums are beating, and I worked in mainstream television news in this country during the run-up to the Iraq war, when the war drums are beating, they don't let you put on opposing views. We tried to get opposing views that question the evidence, the intelligence that would justify an attack on Iraq, but we were kicked off the air. And now you're finding it's, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare that's happening again. At the same time, Jeff, most people who work in major media, and I, of course, did as well, don't believe this. They don't buy this. They feel like they do have the freedom uh, to 
to, to cover issues uh, and that the uh, networks are much more diverse in their right. point of view than outsiders like you uh, right. and maybe now me would right. say. Well, the, the way to rebut that fiction is just to look at what happened in the wake of the Iraq invasion. Those of us who question the evidence that this, they were a weapons of mass destruction threat, we were totally right, and most of us got kicked out of the TV networks. The people who got it wrong have promoted up. So this idea of diversity in the mainstream media or good journalism will win out certainly hasn't been proven in the last 10 years where the, the journalists who got it right have been punished, sanctioned, or kicked out of the media. And the journalists who got it wrong, most of them have more power today to blow smoke at Iran than they had even when uh, they were blowing smoke at Iraq. Those people, the people who own institutions, are usually very conscious of their power, not just as individuals, but as part of a dominant class, says independent TV producer Brian Drolet. So there's a lot of talk here about Democrats and Republicans. Should we vote for the Democrats? Should we vote for the Republicans? There's a lot of talk about, you know, the rich versus the 99 percent. But it's, it's kind of, you know, the, the, there's a certain kind of amnesia about the structure of our society that at one point in this country at least had some currency. You know, in the 30s and even in the 60s, you could talk about the working class. Nobody talks about the working class. It's all about there's a middle class and then there's the 1%, as if there's, you know, and I guess then there's some, you know, poor blacks and Latinos or something, right? And I think that that word has been sanitized and scrubbed out of the vocabulary of the people of the United States, including out of the vocabulary of the left. Now, that's not the entire left, but even the people that use the word class don't seem to have the ability to, to phrase it in a way that actually means something to people. To talk about class is not to talk about a conspiracy, but a complex system that's evolved over the years, a system that is stratified and uses campaign contributions and lobbying to ensure that the politicians do the bidding of the companies. So these are the building blocks of the analysis we'll explore in this series on Who Rules America. The argument is simple but hard for many Americans to comprehend because many of us want to believe the myths we learned in school that make us feel superior to other countries and other peoples. This has been called American exceptionalism. Many in America believe that God created this country as the greatest country on earth, and that's what makes it so special. So you really have to start with that as a basis for how the United States was founded. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz is one leader of America's indigenous people, the first Americans. They were the ones uh, to be eliminated uh, because it was their land that was wanted, not even their labor. Like in, in Latin America, uh, the, the indigenous people were enslaved and, and made into uh, peasants, peons. But in North America, the Anglo-colonialism Anglo in Canada, U.S., New Zealand, and Australia had the motive of simply wiping them out and taking their land. So it's not just that they weren't included, they, they were to be eliminated. And so questions about the custodians of real power and who rules America lead back to debates on how to remake power, how to challenge its distribution and make it more transparent and accountable. These are the issues that the Occupy Wall Street movement is raising as it challenges institutional power in an attempt to revive grassroots democracy. <laughs> David DeGraw explains Occupy's origins. I mean, it was like such a confluence of events. You know, everything was moving in this direction. You know, I, I was I was looking at around the world. You know, there was, there was protests happening in Egypt, and then it moved to you know the Arab Spring, Tunisia, and all throughout Europe. It came back, and it was just a matter of time before it hit the United States. And really, if you look, the the occupations globally, you know, they they became like the thing to do. So it's just a natural progression for it to show up here. I feel like it shows up here because, you know, even though co wealth is so concentrated, you know, the, the people have a, a media system where they're so propagandized 
and they feel isolated. But you know, Occupy shows that people are you know not suffering alone. They're coming out and, and raising awareness, and we change the national discourse. The movement is up against powerful forces with large budgets and the backing of police forces and the political establishment. While these activists are on the front lines of the fight for a people-ruled America, many of its people share the same hope. Do you have a sense of class being important in this country, that there being like an upper class or oh, God. working class? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a waitress at a very nice restaurant and it's very clear to me, you know, where you know, what my role is and who I am, you know, and you can tell just just from the dialogue that I have with people, you know. Um, recently, I, had, I I talked to a general manager of a fairly large business in our town, and you know, when when I mentioned that I was going to a public school, you know. I got kind of an eye roll and oh yeah, my tax dollars pay for that, you know, and it's... So you feel like there's all this resentment against working people kind of feeling like they don't deserve what they're, what little they're getting? Absolutely, absolutely. And especially, you know, with, with the recent attacks on public sector employees, like on, on, on teachers and, you know, people are, are saying, you know, they don't deserve those benefits. We all don't get those benefits, so so they don't deserve them either, you know, or like why isn't the conversation, maybe we should all work to get those for everyone instead of taking it away from the few that do have them. You know, when, when I hear you talking, uh, you know, I realize there's a, such a bigger picture here that most people even understand that we have you know, a country where the dream is slipping away for so many people uh, and they don't feel particularly powerful. They don't feel like they can do anything. They can achieve anything. They can make a difference. Right. Well, I think the dream has shifted to uh, hopefully I wake up tomorrow and I'll be able to pay my rent and keep a roof over my head, you know, or it's just like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll work on achieving my dream tomorrow, but today, you know, I have to, I have to go to class, you know, and I have to, you know, I have to get my work done. I have to go to work and I have to try to squeeze a couple hours of sleep in and then, you know, and it's... Now, now you're here at this conference mm -hmm. with all these brilliant theoreticians and analysts and professors and experts and leaders mm -hmm. and how do you feel about this, this idea of that people have to get together to make a difference? I think it's wonderful. <laughs> I, I'm, I feel so blessed to be able to be here with people like that because I want to learn, you know, somebody had, you know, had said to me, well, why don't you leave where you are? And I don't think that's the answer. I think that it's my job as somebody who cares about these things to learn from these people, to learn from these brilliant minds. And so I can take this back to people and, 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 and show them and explain to them where we don't have access to this kind of thing every day, you know, and so hopefully try to enlighten them a little bit. Aaron expresses the hopes of many ordinary Americans who want to reshape the nature of power so that the 99%, not just the 1% can rule. But as you can see in here, it's not a battle she feels she is winning. Perhaps that's why she, like many, want to know who rules America. Coming up in the next episode of Who Rules America, how the history of conflict between the 99% and the 1% goes back to the American Revolution. The degree of inequality Never before has the very, very top, the 1%, had so much of the national income and wealth in its own hands. Next time on Who Rules America.